Welcome to Law Officer Live is October 19th, 2016, and there is no better place for you to be than right here. We're tucked in conveniently right before the last presidential debate that comes on in one hour. So what else do you have to do but to be right here? And the Blue Jays have already lost, so there's really no reason to worry about that. So thank you for being here. Do us a favor. We have an incredible show today, but we need you to share this with your timeline so as many people as possible can view it. Uh, we're going to be talking about tactical medicine. And we're going to be talking with Lieutenant Jim Cook. And, did, and if you don't know who Lieutenant Jim Cook is, you've probably seen this photo uh, that's been going literally viral all over the Internet. And it's, of course, a Jim standing behind San Francisco 49er backup quarterback Colin Kaepernick and saluting to the national anthem as Kaepernick is kneeling. And actually, I think Kaepernick did play against the Buffalo Bills that game and they lost by at least 40 points. But that's another show in itself. But to listen to Jim, and we're gonna have Jim on the show later in this episode, we have a lot to get to before that. So as we get to that, please hit share on your Facebook timeline, send people the link, tell folks about it. We're also broadcasting live on YouTube. Uh, that will be on the front page of our website. Uh, just as soon as the show is over with. So thank you for tuning in today. It's been an incredible week in law enforcement, as each week seems to be. This week is no different. We want to thank our sponsor for today's episode. It's Blue Armor Supplements. It's right here in front of me. And what we love about Blue Armor is it's the only supplement company made for law enforcement by law enforcement. And they have the GMP seal of approval. And what does that mean? All GMP means is, is what you buy is what you get. You would be amazed at the supplements out there that that what you're buying is you're not even getting anything close to that. We've had reports of officers testing positive for different illegal drugs because they were taking a supplement. Well, most supplement companies do not get GMP certified, which is very suspicious to us. And we wanted to make sure that whatever company we partner with had that certification. So it's a GMP seal on the back of any supplement bottle. Look at your supplement bottles. If you don't see that seal, then you need to holler at Blue Armor. You can find us there at bluearmor.com. So we're very proud of what they're doing for law enforcement. So thank them today. Our news item of the week uh, is an article on our website, right there on the front page under the editorial section. It's called, The Mayor of Boston, It's Time. And this is an editorial that we put out earlier this week after two Boston police officers responded to a disturbance call. Uh, and, and the guy literally ambushed him. He had a long rifle, he had a handgun, he had a, a ballistic vest on, and really uh, we were very, very fortunate that we didn't lose those officers. Both officers were very critical. Uh, one went home from the hospital today. That article is up at lawofficer.com. The other one is still in the hospital, but he has been upgraded to stable, so our prayers remain with Boston. But what is absolutely ludicrous about this story is what many people didn't know. In fact, I believe we were the only ones that reported on this, that back in August, the mayor of Boston, Martin Walsh, was sent a letter from the police union and the union leaders that said our officers need additional body armor and our officers need rifles. And Walsh just absolutely dismissed it. He, in fact, his quote was that he was taken aback by this request. How ludicrous is it that police officers would want rifles? Well, I'll tell you right now, a good police officer would want a rifle because many, many bad guys have rifles and we owe it to our police officers, we owe it to our community to provide them with the equipment that's needed. And there's nothing wrong with the police officer wanting a level 3A or above vest that could maybe stop uh, others shooting rifle fire with the armor that some of those come with. So that's what was requested. It was completely dismissed by the mayor. And let me tell you what, if we would have lost those officers this week, we may be broadcasting live from San Francisco right now on the mayor's front doorstep. But we didn't do that. We didn't jump the gun this quick, but he needs to wake up and he needs to protect his officers. And by the way, who's he listening to? He makes allusions uh, in these articles from August, and we covered it in this editorial called The Mayor of Boston, It's Time, front page of lawofficer.com. He made allusions to that the people in the community didn't want the department to be too militarized. Okay, we've heard this before. This is really a bunch of nonsense from a bunch of people that aren't in law enforcement that are saying, do not become militarized. Well, given your officers the basic equipment needed to do their job is not making them the military. It's making them prepared and it's making them able to protect their community. Because I'll tell you right now, 
Those so-called community activists that are staying down in San Francisco, if they were walking down the street when that shootout happened last week, do you think they want those officers well prepared? Of course they would. So let's just quit being silly. And this is just a mayor playing, playing politician. You know, no one is, would ever think about walking into a hospital, right, and maybe they're unhappy with it or maybe they're not, and walk out and go, we demand this from all of our doctors. Well, no, why, why would you, we leave and listen to you? You're not in the medical field. Why do law enforcement or why do mayors let people not in law enforcement tell them what to do? Now, we used to listen to the community. But when it comes to things that are law enforcement matters, things that law enforcement needs for resources, things that law enforcement needs to protect themselves and the community, we're the experts. And maybe some of you so-called activists that watch this so religiously don't agree with that. Well, I say, go to school, get your criminal justice degree, enter the police academy, become a police officer, and then we'd be glad to listen to you if you don't think that the equipment we're carrying is necessary. But as it stands now, Yes, police officers in America need rifles. Ask LAPD when the bank robbery happened 20 years ago in downtown LA and they're running into gun shops grabbing rifles off the shelf, okay? Of course they got rifles after that. Ask the Dallas Police Department after the five officers were gunned down by a man with a rifle. They were carrying rifles in. Some of them, more of them are carrying rifles today. And ask the Oklahoma City PD that had to go out and buy their own rifles and now they're getting rifles. Of course, the Progressive Department wants rifles. That doesn't mean we're shouldering our rifles, walking around, you know, like we're in the military. Although there are some cities that you see, you see officers routinely do this, uh, but it does mean that we have those tools at our disposal if we need them. So we, we touched on that this week. That's our news item of the week. The mayor needs to step up. He needs to take this tragedy that occurred and do the right thing and get the officers that needed equipment. And I'll say this to the officers at San Francisco, we have your back. Maybe your mayor doesn't. I don't know much about your chief or commissioner, but they ought to be advocating for you to have the proper equipment as well. And then when people get upset about that, they should be the leader that it takes to explain that to the community. I'll easily explain to anybody who wants to listen. The problem is many of them don't want to listen. And, uh, but we should be able to articulate why we need this equipment. Well, we need it simply because the elements that we're facing, the violent criminals we're facing so many times have this equipment. So why would we not give well-trained professionals that equipment? I mean, most people in America can walk into a sporting goods store and buy this gun. Why would we not give that to police officers that have been well-trained and well-educated in the area? So it's really ludicrous. And we keep kind of falling into this trap where we're sort of scared and running around. And we don't want to, we're listening to these so-called activists. That quite frankly, many of the activists I've met couldn't even qualify to be a police officer. I mean, some people get upset about that, but I would say, saddle up, enter the academy, apply for the academy. Let's see how it goes, you know? Uh, I would, I want them to come on to be in law enforcement because I think it's going to just educate them more in some of the things they're saying. So I'm not going to run around here and, and tell a dentist how to do their job or a doctor how to do their job or a banker how to do their job. But for some reason, people think they can run around and tell the cops how to do their job. But let me tell you this, when it comes to equipment and the resources that we need, we can't let them tell us that. We have to do what's right for the community. And what's right for the community is our officers are well armed to, to take the fight to the fight if it does occur. So that's today, that's this week's rant. I'm sure we'll have something totally different to rant about next week. Uh, thank you for listening to that. We wanna remind you about our great partner in the line of duty films. We introduced you to this partner last week. Uh, Ron Barber and the crew that are in the line of duty has been doing this for well over two decades. They are the original kind of, kind of founders of online training, DVD training. And what I love about this company is this is not some two or three minute entertaining video. When you take training at in the line of duty films, you literally are getting a full documentary style professional film video with things to ponder, a test at the end, and it's accredited in most states. And if it's not accredited in a state, it will get accredited in a state if you need it to. So we are very thankful of that partner. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit more about them, but first we wanna show you this quick video and I'm gonna kinda of give you just an example of what they do. Why do I have to show you my permit? I don't have to show you my permit, permit. Yeah, right? I'm not showing you anything. I want to order my food and get up out of here. Here's a little dust up a Connecticut officer had. He'd been standing in line at a fast food restaurant when he saw a bulge under a man's shirt, an obvious gun. I'm the public, you're a public servant. I can walk where I want to and not be, and I'm, I'm requesting not to show you anything. When the officer commented he'd like to see the man's ID, 
the subject refused. Since Connecticut is an open carry state, this one got all sorts of feedback. If there wasn't reasonable suspicion of a crime, the man's attorney claimed he shouldn't have been approached by the officer. Ah, but the state's undersecretary for criminal justice said the cop had every right to determine if the man was legally carrying, that without the proper ID, it would have been a felony punishable by five years imprisonment. Am I a suspect of a crime? I'm asking you for your pistol permit. After other officers arrived, the man with the camera was told the restaurant would refuse to serve him. He left, telling the police they didn't know the law. But in an email to members of the department, officers were told if the person refuses, the officer can arrest the person for interfering with an officer. A spokesman for the Bridgeport Mayor's Office said, Look at it from the point of view of law enforcement. There's been an uptick in shootings and violent crime in Bridgeport in the past year. And these officers were responding to a complaint and they acted with restraint and professionalism. For further information, simply Google Bridgeport Police Officer and Open Carry. I don't know what those stars mean. And question. In a similar situation, what would you have done? Yes, I am. That is a short excerpt from one of the videos, one of the training segments you get within the line of duty films uh, called Nuggets for Street Cops. I love that particular video. I watched all of it today. It's a little over 30 minutes long. It's just one example of what you get when you subscribe to their service. So let me tell you real quickly what you get when you subscribe to their service. You get hundreds of videos to play online 24 hours a day. It's trackable, so your training manager and your agency can track that, see how long you're watching. And by the way, you can't cheat. I tried to cheat on one earlier and take the test and it wouldn't let me because it knew I didn't watch all the videos. So that's something that a lot of the competitors don't even come close to. So this is really uh, a partner that we want to push to you. It's important to do that. Uh, that particular video is excellent. It's given you, uh, the full video gives you quick tidbits on always looking above. It shows one excerpt where there's a suspect above on a roof and the officers aren't, don't even, aren't even noticing. It gives you a quick uh, tidbit on how to tell if someone's lying, interrogation techniques. Uh, it's just outstanding and that's just an example of what they offer. And for you, the law, law officer audience, if you tell them that you heard about it on Law Officer, you're gonna get a discount on that subscription. Let me tell you, that subscription cost is absolutely pennies compared to what, to what the value is. I think you'll find it very, very competitive when it comes to the rate. Contact them at their website and they'll give you a free trial uh, just to get started, to see what's in their library. And they're doing that because once you do that, you're gonna want this, you really need this. And today's law enforcement, today's training, uh, for the money you're going to spend for this, it's well worth it avoiding the liability down the line. So we love our friends and partners over to In the Line of Duty Films. Check them out and uh, they will do you uh, some great things. So uh, we're very excited about that. Now we're going to bring our guest on. We told you starting off that we're going to be talking about tactical medicine. And the reason we're going to talk about tactical medicine is is because in Boston, I know I tripped up earlier and talked about San Francisco. I've got San Francisco on my mind calling Kaepernick backup quarterback for some reason, NFL ratings down. But what, but what it's about Boston because these two cops, uh, uh, one was saved with a tourniquet last week in Boston. Thankfully, uh, he was still very critical afterwards, but a tourniquet saved his life that night. And so we thought, what better time than to really talk about this really important issue for law enforcement. So before we get that, let's show you this quick video met one of the Tulsa police officers who saved a life over the weekend. Doctors say if it wasn't for them and their training, the outcome would have been much different. Two Works For You reporter Jitzel Puente is live in West Tulsa with more on this heroic act, Jitzel. Brian, this is where Officer Ramsey and another officer responded to the 911 call this weekend. Officer Ramsey tells me that if it wasn't for his training and that first aid kit, that outcome would have been very different. What Tally, Officer Kelly did is he held his hands down, kept his thigh down, we did it nice and tight, and then we started spinning it. 
Tulsa police officer Charles Ramsey explains how he helped a man from bleeding out this past weekend. While some people are calling him a hero, Officer Ramsey is humbled and says his fellow officers would have done the same. I don't like to use the word hero because it's just I was at the right spot at the right time and I had a tourniquet and I knew how to use it. Officer Ramsey and another officer found the man lying unconscious at this West Tulsa apartment, bleeding from his leg after breaking through his glass door and falling from a flight of stairs. If it wasn't for the officers and their training, the situation could have been worse. You know, all these officers made a real sacrifice uh, to, to be able to get these skills, and so uh, I'm just proud to see uh, my classmates go be able to go out and make a difference. Major Ryan Perkins is one of the instructors for the emergency medical technician course at TCC. He says Officer Ramsey had just completed his six-month training, which came into play this weekend. On top of that, all officers are now required to carry a first aid kit since 2014. We've had had uh, several halo chest seals used uh, in stabbing and shooting victims uh, throughout the city of Tulsa. Uh, and uh, this is the second or third tourniquet usage uh, that's been a save. This was the third time Officer Ramsey saved a life on duty. And he says thanks to the tools the department provides, he's able to respond in a more efficient manner. Now we can bridge those critical few minutes. But when we get there to advance life support, get there, we can try to do the best we can, at least help get that process started. So what's next for Officer Ramsey? He tells me he's taking an advanced EMT course. He says you can never be too prepared to save a life. In West Tulsa, Jitzel Puente, to works for you. Okay. What you just saw was the handiwork of Officer Anthony first. Anthony, thank you for being here today. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Uh, I call him a tactical uh, medicine expert. He's much more than that. He's a 17-year veteran with the Tulsa Police Department. That's what that video referenced there. He's a paramedic. He teaches all over the country in that issue. He has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and many, many other things. I just I was just talking to him before the show, and he's literally traveling all over the country with his passion, which is giving law enforcement the tools they need to save others' lives and to save their lives. And, and Anthony, I got to tell you, you know, I, I, of course, am familiar with some of your work and some of your passion, but it's unique. You know, I think very few people going to law enforcement thinking, well, I'm going to be putting a tourniquet on people and doing CPR and all this first aid stuff. And you've really brought that to modern times. And how did you get interested in that? Well, I'm, I'm sure like several other officers out there watching right now, I kind of tripped into being a medic first. I always wanted to be a police officer. Since young as I can remember, I wanted right. to be a police officer. And uh, in 1990, when I started college, a friend asked me if I wanted to go learn how to be an EMT. And so I did. I was too young to be a police officer at that time. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with that also. I became an EMT in 1991, a paramedic in 94. And the way this all kind of crossed is in 1996, I went to a school called Contoms. A counter narcotic tactical operation medical support school. And I would assume in the mid 90s, a law enforcement officer with a med, med kit was unheard of, right? Correct, correct. At that time, most of them, almost all the medical training for police officers was your basic first aid. It's how to treat a snake bite, it's how to keep from getting overheated, mm -hmm. it's what to do with poison ivy. Here's a vest and a gun, go out and do your job. And that was pretty much all the first right. aid training back then. And at Contoms, though, this was my first tactical EMS school. This is the first time I ever had the opportunity to take regular field medical skills, if you will, those that you might see on an ambulance, and put them in a hostile environment, an environment that involves gas, an environment that involves a, a potential threat or a moving threat, right. and then certainly lots of yelling and screaming, uh, stress levels far above what even a, a field medic would experience in an ambulance. And I fell in love with that particular field. I absolutely loved it. And when I, I remember coming home from the airport saying, I want to have a job someday that allows me to be a police officer and do this at the same time, both be involved with the special operations team and provide the training. Now, you see a lot of videos online, especially on YouTube, because in the military they wear these head cameras, and you see these medics just doing these fine motor skill things yes. out in the middle of a battlefield, and it's incredible to watch. Is that from the type of training that you're talking about? Yes, yes. This is starting, It's it, this is crawl, walk, run. This is taking our officers and showing them some very basic, easy to do skills. And then when they master that, slowly uh, upping the stress levels a little bit and exposing them or inoculating them to that stress. Right. So that should it ever happen in real life, which is more and more likely nowadays, yeah. they won't be so unfamiliar with what needs to be done. And uh, of course, familiarity makes them more comfortable and comfort translates to better patient care. You mentioned your training earlier, you know, Know, first aid to EMT to permit. Give our audience just a little bit uh, of understanding of how long that training 
takes and kind of the commitment that it takes? Well, just on the civil, as far as the non-sworn side, the non-officer side, to become a paramedic is about two years of training, depending two on years. where you go. Some places it can be a four-year degree, but for the most part, it's two years, roughly 2,000 to 2,500 hours. Right. And uh, of course, all those hours are geared towards working either in an ambulance or on a helicopter or for a similar service like that. Um, most police officers have the absolute basic level of first aid training required Which by their state. a day or two, right? Maybe a day or two. Right. And a lot of that is CPR, and the rest is still, here's a Band-Aid, here's how to put it on. Right. Um, but our armed forces overseas have learned a great deal about treating trauma. Um, obviously, the last 14 or 15 years overseas, we've had a lot of experience in learning mm -hmm. how to save lives and try and prevent, uh, try and stop preventable deaths overseas. And right. We're slowly catching up with that. We're about 10 years behind the curve from what our military has learned. Slowly it trickles down to law enforcement. We've learned that, well, the body is the same here in the United States, just like it is overseas. And if mm -hmm. it saves a body overseas, it'll save a body here. So you, you mentioned the paramedic is, is two to four years, but how about, I mean, most officers are gonna listen to that and go, man, I can't not commit to that. Most agencies will, will say that. Although you, you have committed some officers to that level of training that, that I know of. Yes, yes. What, what, what would be something less than that that is very attainable for everybody watching? There are, there are a number of good courses uh, that can help a police officer, even a civilian who's interested in knowing it. Police officers get to a point where they're much more comfortable in providing care for someone who's critically injured. Typically, uh, anywhere between eight and 16 hours, depending mm -hmm. on where you go and how much you take. And those courses are predicated on the idea that you've never taken care of someone before. Right. This is day zero, and then at the end of the second day or the first, if it's an eight-hour class, you're much more comfortable with providing these very basic life-saving skill sets. Okay. We're interested to see from you from the audience what your department provides. Uh, I'm sure there's some great stories out there about either department not providing anything or department providing EMT or paramedics. So be sure to get on our comment section. We want to give you a shout out. If you have any questions, we hope to get to them today uh, for Anthony here. Uh, but this is a very important topic. And, and, you know, I think my goal personally, Anthony, and I, we've talked about this, was I would love to become an EMT. You know, that's sort of what most of the basic firefighters have. Mm -hmm. And I know it's roughly six months to a year, but let's say someone is out there and maybe they're like me. They're like, you know, I've got the two days of basic first aid, but I want the next level. Would that next level be EMT? It could depend on how much you want to do with it. Typically, EMT is job related. You want to become a firefighter. You want to become an, okay. e you want to become an EMT for an ambulance service. There are longer courses. For example, there are some two week courses on tactical medicine I got that, it, that just take it to new levels as far as the stress inoculation, as well as incorporate firearms training. Uh, much of it becomes scenario based. Uh, the skills that you're taught are extremely easy. They can, they can be taught to Cub Scouts. Super simple things like the tourniquet and like the chest seals. The challenge comes from doing those in stressful environments. And so we just give yeah. more and more scenarios and depending on where you go, again, eight hours all the way up to two full weeks. Is that where the word tactical medicine comes in? Is that tactical, that stress inoculation that you're talking about? Roughly, tactical sure is a word that we use. It's cool, right? It, it's, yeah, it's, it's it makes great, me want to take the class. It's a great disco yeah. word, you bet. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's simply in this context, it simply means we're taking the medicine that's typically provided in an ambulance and putting that in an environment where it's not usually applied mm -hmm. with, with bad guys. Uh, okay. When we have when we, in a gas environment, a non-permissive environment, when we have to move very quickly, perhaps shots are being fired nearby, uh, that is not a normal medic environment, right. at least not here in the United States. We're taking medicine and putting it into a different environment. Of course, even in paramedics or ambulances or firefighters, I mean, they're in a stressful environment as well. Very much so. Uh, and of course, the value of law enforcement getting that training is, is a lot of times we have to clear scenes before they can come in. So how important is time when it comes to saving lives? It's everything, it's everything. We, we've, we've learned, again, with lots of uh, uh, past lessons learned, we've learned that simply waiting for someone else to come in and take care of someone doesn't always work out very well. I mean, times past, through no one's fault, in times past, it was a police officer's default move to call an ambulance or call fire department and just hope they hurry. Yep. And if the patient was in bad shape, we just scream on the radio and say, tell them to hurry even faster. That's right. That was just the way it was done. And it's not the best thing for the patient. If an officer is not directly involved with taking care of a tactical issue, because tactics should always be first, mm -hmm. if they're not actively doing that, there's no reason why they can't take a few seconds out of their day and provide some of these very simple life-saving skills, skills that we've seen save lives and just continue to save them day after day. Well, it certainly saved a life in Boston, and that is just an incredible story. Thank you for being here today. And I know that I was, I, I was recently on a scene of an officer that was shot and the ambulance was called and when we looked around in about 15 seconds didn't see an ambulance we put him in a car 
and there was somebody treating the officer in the back seat of the car as they mm -hmm. were driving to the hospital. And I think, I think from the time that the officer was shot, it was like less than seven or eight minutes, and he was sitting there in the ER because of that, and he'd already been treated Correct. going there. So that's the importance of it. Timing's everything, and that's why you say, and I, I say too, the police officers need the same training uh, as some of our EMTs and even advanced first aid training so they can treat people then and there without having to wait on ambulance. Certainly, certainly. Um, again, the skills that our military has picked up and, and have applied overseas literally thousands of times, they're very simple. Um, complicated things don't work in the field. Right. And certainly the more stress there is, the less likely someone is to remember to do something very, very uh, uh, fine motor necessary. Uh, but things like applying a tourniquet, applying a chest seal, and right. knowing broader topics such as the need to go ahead and get someone to an ER versus waiting for an ambulance uh, to transport them. The scenario that you're talking about, the situation rather, um, from the time that officer was shot to the time he went through the doors of the ER was four minutes. Four minutes. And I can tell you that our local EMS is a great service, but they were having a bad day that day and that ambulance wasn't actually dispatched to him for nine minutes. Yeah. So he was at the hospital. In four minutes, it would have been another nine before the ambulance even showed up at the scene. And those seconds, they, they count. Right. They really do. You're passionate about it. I know you do a lot of training around the country. They can reach you at safetac.org. I know you train with that company as well. Uh, and so I'm sure you have a message to send every officer. If you were to tell every officer, this is the basic that you need tomorrow, and you need to start working on this tomorrow, I'm gonna assume it's gonna be more than one day. Well, what would you tell an officer out there? I mean, this is the ba this is the general basic you need. The the, the basic, say it this way, the, the, uh, the program the military has implemented is called TC3, short for Tactical Combat Casualty Care. And the uh, National Association of EMTs, which can be found online, they teach these classes anywhere between eight and 16 hours. Mm -hmm. And there is a slightly less military version called Tactical Emergency Combat Care, which is essentially the same class, the same skills, with less military jargon right. involved because the class was originally a military class. They can find these classes all over the country. There are lots of institutions and agencies. That what about online? Let's say you're in, I don't want to pick on any state, but we'll sure. just say Iowa. Okay. You know, and, and I mean, there's really not anything around you to, to take. Is there, any, is there any type of online programs, online training you would recommend? As far as online training, that's hard to do in this particular right. area because this is a this is a hands-on skill set. But again, these skills are very easy. There's no reason why someone who would not have otherwise have access to a face-to-face -face training mm. couldn't go online and see how to do these things. Okay. You can simply Google TC3 or Tactical Combat Casualty Care. You can read the, the concepts within it and say, I, I would like to learn how to do that. Right. And you can just Google those particular concepts and a video can teach you how to do it. Now, of course, a face-to-face -face right. gives you a better opportunity to do that. But if you have no other access to such training, online's a great way, way to go. Now, once you get the training, there's certain tools the officers need. We talked earlier about Boston and, mm -hmm. and the, the mayor not providing uh, rifles or, or you know, protective, you know, tactical protection armor and gear, uh, but they had tourniquets. So mm -hmm. the, obviously the department had provided them tourniquets. So other than a tourniquet, I mean, that should be a basic. Every officer should be carrying a tourniquet. Every officer should understand how to use that. Is there anything besides a tourniquet you would recommend? I would recommend they carry uh, emergency trauma dressing, uh, simply a pre-packed compression bandage is all okay. it is, usually four inches, available from a number of plug up holes online. in a body. It's, it's not just to plug it up, but there are times, for example, when a patient's arm or leg is simply too small for a pre-manufactured tourniquet to go on to. Okay. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the potential of school shootings. Children have small arms, and the tourniquets that most of us are familiar with, um, they were built for military-aged adults. Right. These tourniquets may be too big. With emergency trauma dressing, when applied correctly, can shut down arterial bleed on right. a person with a small arm or even on a geriatric patient. Okay. So if, if only those two things alone, and if they only had one thing to carry, I can't stress enough, please carry a tourniquet. They add three and a half ounces to your kit. You'll never notice it's there, but there's nothing else that can do what a pre-manufactured tourniquet can do. And it's interesting that this occurred in Boston. These tourniquets were not issued out to their police department until after the Boston bombings, yep. the Marathon bombings. When those bombings occurred, tourniquets were not part of the equipment list for EMS fire or police at that time. So all the tourniquets that were wow. applied to the roughly 72 amputations that occurred in that incident, all the tourniquets that were applied were improvised. And, and God bless them for trying. Most of them were shirts and shoelaces and whatever were available. Mm. Uh, but in reviewing that, over 90% of those tourniquets failed to do the job. So when we think, well, I'll just use my inner belt or I'll use my ASP or I'll, I'll right. create one, improvise real quickly, those typically don't yeah. work very well. Yeah, it's, 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 it's funny you mentioned that Boston waited until the Boston bombing to give tourniquets, and now we still have a mayor, you may you probably don't want to get into this, that is apparently waiting for something bad to happen to give 
other needed equipment. I think law enforcement, we need to start being so reactive. We need to be more proactive. And if you're watching this and your department's not providing these tools for you, how much does a tourniquet cost? Anywhere, usually about 30 bucks. Yeah, usually or you can contact us and, and can... we'll sell them to you for 300. <laughs> usually the neighborhood about $30, but a lot of vendors that sell these things will give, you know, group discounts right. if you if you buy a number of them. And uh, unfortunately, it is the nature of law enforcement that oftentimes things won't change until someone gets hurt. Yeah. Uh, this isn't one of those things that we should wait for. Right. You have 90 seconds if it's your artery that gets cut, three to four minutes if your buddy's artery gets cut, and that's just not enough time to simply to suddenly call the chief and say, we need tourniquets right now. Right. You've only it, got a few seconds just, to do something. It's so basic, it's so cheap, there's just no mm -hmm. reason why we why we, we shouldn't be doing it. Right, right. Um, I know that you are involved at a high level at your agency and other agencies, and this is, obviously, if you can't tell, this is what Anthony does. This is what you were put on this earth by God to teach officers this, and it's, it's, it's bringing this training from the military Oh, I said military. Those of you that don't like the term military for some reason, right? <laughs> Thank God we have the military because it enables Colin Kaepernick not to get back to that, to get on his knees. It enables us to be free. It enables Lieutenant Jim Cook to stand at attention next to him and salute the American flag. Thank God we have the military. So I'm not ashamed. We're not ashamed to talk about the military and to steal ideas from the military. So we're thankful to bring these militarized ideas. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I shouldn't even go there. But these are great militarized ideas to help save people's lives. And... And I would assume that um, you, there's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, officers, a lot of officers didn't, I mean, I, I didn't come on the job thinking I would be needing to carry a tourniquet and, you know, and because, I mean, we usually shied away from that kind of stuff. So what type of reaction do the officers give you when you're there to teach them these things that maybe they didn't know they were going to be learning? Uh, initially, it's like anything new. Uh, right. Any government agency, police departments for sure, don't like change. Right. You walk into the squad room, hey guys, here's something new. You get the eye rolling, you get the, I don't want to do more paperwork, and I completely get that. Um, in this particular world, police officers and firefighters are some of our worst students because of the right. hardest to change. Uh, but I, I, I remind them at the beginning of every class, as any instructor should, that you spend a lot of time training on your firearm, as we should. That is a right. very important concept. What are you more likely going to need in your career, your firearm or medical equipment? Right. Which one? And for the most part, you will not make it through your career without bumping into someone who is critically injured. Yeah. Now, more and more of us, unfortunately, will have to use our firearm before the end of our career, but it's a guarantee you will meet yeah. critically injured patients before you retire. Yeah. So uh, when you put it in that perspective, okay, go ahead and show us how to do it. And then once they see it done, once they see their partner or another officer actually right. save a life with this in just a matter of a few seconds, see that happen, all of a sudden the interest grows. Wow. More people want to know how to do it. And in our department, in the last two years or so, we've made almost 50 saves. Uh, and these aren't just sketchy saves, if you will, where we're just trying to right. inflate the numbers a little bit. These are folks were dead. Right. Well, they, they were not going to make it if someone did not intervene in the next minute or two. Right. And our officers got involved, and because they were involved, and these have all been reviewed by our, our medical control board later on, these our citizens are still with us. And not just citizens, but one of our canine officers. Yeah. Two years ago, we saved not only one of our furry friends who cut an artery on a call, but also an $8,000 asset. Right. So um, it's uh, the, the success is contagious. Officers see it done. Mm -hmm. They realize it's not difficult. They realize it may very well be their own life that they save. Mm -hmm. It makes it much easier to push this out and not just the officers i've actually had a number of family members of officers come up and just say how thankful this training is is out it's there incredible. because they, they can take it home that's it well not yeah. just that but they want their you know our family members love us very much they are our greatest support structure and i've had wives and husbands and, and even a couple kids walk up right. and just say thank you for making it easier for my mom or dad to come back to me and it's not to toot my own horn all i'm doing is just translating some information yeah. but our family members want us to come home so anything that we can do to make that better, to make that uh, a greater chance of happening. Anything we can do to make that happen, we should be doing it. Yeah, well, I'll, we'll toot your horn here at Law Officer. What you're doing is incredible. We want to push this out to as many in the profession as we possibly can. I know many of you probably have questions and comments, and I'm just going to go straight to our producer, Josh. If you haven't seen Josh on camera yet, I know you're begging for it. Uh, go ahead and describe what Josh looks like. And by the way, if you keep getting on the conversation and say, we want to see Josh, we will get him on camera, hopefully. He's been very resistant to it. But <laughs> go ahead, and, as Josh is getting a question together, describe the audience what you see in this man we call Josh. Oh, you could put this on me. I okay, will. okay. Well, he's a very handsome man. I, I wouldn't I, go that I, far. I, 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 I really very, wouldn't go he's that a very far. Han, he's a very handsome Compared man. Compared to me and you? <laughs> 
He's a very handsome man, and right now he's, about looking, his muscular build. he's looking a little bit irritated with this right now. So I, yeah, yeah, yeah note to self, not don't about. upset the dispatcher or the producer. No, no, never yeah. hack off the medic, never hack off the cook. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What do you have for us, Josh? Well, after all that, um, <laughs> I, I do have a, uh, a question here for you. Uh, this is from Phil. How did you get interested in this in this topic? It's a great, great question. Again, very good question. Uh, thanks for asking it, Phil. Um, I, I started back in 1996 with the first tactical medical school I went to down in Glencoe, Georgia. I've been to several since. Uh, it's kind of one of those deals where um, I was just shown that there's more to medicine and emergency medicine than just being on an ambulance or being in a helicopter. Right. There is a need for these two career paths to cross. There is a need for EMS and police to meet at, at a certain point. Police officers can't just be police officers only right. and leave someone else to solve all of our medical problems. Um, I got interested in it when I, it was probably the third officer involved shooting scene that I was on. And this was in another agency, mm -hmm. but it prompted me to, uh, uh, to seek out more training. I need to be better capable of doing these skills in a more hostile and more stressful environment. I know one particular officer that actually became a paramedic. It took him a lot, a lot of hours, and he was, he became committed to this type of training when a, basically a little girl died in his arms, and he didn't have the training mm -hmm. to save the girl. So I would ask you in our audience that maybe you're like that. Maybe you're out there and you're thinking, man, I probably need to get this. I need to, I need to work towards this. Think about those nights after that occurs, right? I mean, I know, I, I know that uh, there was nothing he could done. You know, I mean, that, that was just that was. That was, you know, uh, something that, you know, wasn't his fault that the, the, the girl was violently uh, assaulted, uh, but the department did not give him that training at the time. You know, he had no idea that that's something he needed to do, but he became so committed to that. He not only got to an EMT, he went all the way to paramedic, which is really incredible. Now, let me ask you this. Let's say you get this training. Let's say you get EMT, get paramedic. Unlike much training you get, there's ongoing training with that, is there not? Oh, yes, very much so. Uh even by NTOA standards, your medical personnel assigned to a special operations team typically train three times as much as anyone else. So for right. every one hour that someone trains, the medics are training for three hours. There is a lot of- the Medics always get screwed. Eh, we're, we're the busiest folks that you yeah. never see. Yeah. We're always yeah. in the background. You hope that your medics are bored, wherever they are. You want bored medics, that means things are going well. Right. Uh, but if things suddenly go bad, your medic suddenly becomes the most important person there. But you want that medic to have gone through those many hours of training. Yeah. Um, it is tough. It is tough keeping up with the hours. Um, much like law enforcement, everything in medicine changes almost weekly. Yeah. Uh, every time you turn around, there's a change to this or a different procedure or a different way of doing things. And it's tough to keep up with that. But at the end of the day, you have to remember and ask yourself, why are you doing it? Yeah. At the end of the day, it's for your patient. And it's it may be for your your academy mate, your best friend, or maybe one of your family members or someone you care about. And, and the officer that you speak of, very, very good friend of mine, um, I can, and I, I pass this on to other officers, there's, there's no more helpless feeling than wondering if you could have done something to help someone who right. died right there in front of you. And it's, it's, of course, it's highest highs and lowest lows right. in our job, and our lows suck. Right. They really do, they yeah. are absolutely horrible. And I know many officers who have lost many nights of sleep wondering, could I have done more of one right. way or the other? And many of those officers have increase their training at, at, on their uh, on their own, which is yeah. speaks so highly of them. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the sort of falsehoods and myths that we have become accustomed to hearing is, oh, police officers do not have a sanctity of life and they don't care about the lives of people. Oh, okay. That's the most bogus yes. nonsense. I mean, that's why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. That's why officers go get training. Mm -hmm. That's why officers continue to build on this. That's why you're always busy training people because mm -hmm. there's a thirst for this. People do this job to actually save lives and uh, you know, the, the hatred that kind of comes with sort of that small, small fragment of people. We have to remember it's a small, small fragment. I know a lot of our audience get very discouraged hearing some of that stuff. You have to understand 99% of the people, they are behind you. They do. Uh, they, they really are. They, they really are. It's just, it's just the fact is, it's this very small element is just so loud and obnoxious, quite frankly. Uh, you know, and I love it. I told somebody today, I was actually at my dentist office and and they said, how do you find the show? And I go, well, if you stumble across the show, you're doing something. I didn't even tell them. <laughs> uh, but they, they were telling me about some of this uh, some of this rhetoric out there. And I said, you know, I said, kind of the problem that has happened, and I was kind of joking, is, is if someone's a jerk, you know, we can't, I mean, why does it have to be about race or whatever? Sometimes if you're a jerk, you know, you get treated the way you treat others. So, uh, you know, just quit, people just need to quit being, 
jerks. <laughs> you know, I, my, my father that told me. a good t-shirt right there. Yeah, my, my father taught me, the day I graduated academy, and he was a 20-year plus veteran law enforcement. He said, the only advice he gave me was, uh, just treat people the way they treat you. You know, and I, I think that served all of us well. And uh, nothing gives people a right to be a jerk to, to law enforcement. And I don't know why you would expect law enforcement to be so kind and nice when they're being literally verbally assaulted. You know, uh, now we're not advocating using force on people that are verbally being assaulted, but we need to, everybody needs to be a little more uh, uh, polite and respectful. Respect is everything. You know? I, my mom would and, agree uh, as well. And, uh, you know, and in law enforcement, we train and we teach people to be very respectful. But quite frankly, if somebody becomes very verbally abusive, that's a sign of aggression. And it's really hard to, to expect a police officer just to be all cutty, 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 nice with people when they're like that. So um, it's, it's an interesting time for sure. And I think uh, a lot of people have lost, they feel like it's their right to be disrespectful to people of authority, whether it's law enforcement or, or people at the restaurant or, or lifeguards. And, and really that's a sad time in America. It's, it's definitely rough. I, I, I have two children, I have a 15 year old son, a 13 yeah. year old daughter, and, and I work very hard to always remind them that uh, I get that being rude and not caring is kind of the end thing. Now. Right, right. I completely get that because we had our own weird things when I was in school as well. Uh, but I try and contend to remind them that that's, that's not a real thing. It shouldn't be that way. Right. That it, it's being kind is free. Yeah. Yeah. You know, life's just not going to go well for people if they're rude to people. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you're just not going to go home to the day and go, man, everybody was nice to me. You know, if you're rude to people, most people are sort of a little rude back. You know? That's to be expected. And, and we, we should hold law enforcement to a very high standard. You know, we should be as professional as can be uh, to the to the 15th degree. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're human. You know, and if you keep treating people really, really badly, it's kind of hard to understand. It's not hard to understand why sometimes, you know, law enforcement, maybe they mouth off back, you know, some once in a while. Um, and, you know, that's why when we see Jim Cook that saluted with, behind Colin Kaepernick, he was being respectful, just like, I, you, know, I, you know, we've talked a lot about Kaepernick and I'm getting off topic, but I got to give him this. He's been respectful. You know, he's, he hasn't been rude to people. He's just quietly being respectful of what he's doing. I, I, he's completely off base. He doesn't understand the facts of the situation, but I, I'll, I'll give him this. He's been respectful. And, uh, and so we'll get to Jim in a minute. If you're not really talking about the photo of the officer saluting behind Colin Kaepernick that everyone's seen on, uh, online, is uh, we're going to we're going to interview Jim here in a minute, and it's a really fascinating interview. And, and listen, Tony, I'm glad you're here. I got a couple more questions for you. Um, technology, mm -hmm. obviously, that has evolved. How has technology changed what you do when it comes to tech medicine? It's uh, it's made the world smaller, as it has yeah. with everything. Uh, I mentioned earlier that it, it becomes contagious when you see someone do something really cool like saving a life, how that becomes contagious and other people want to get involved with that as well. And the internet has made the world smaller. Right. That. We, we are able to see stories and similar examples from Boston, from uh, from Norman, from other places right. around the country where officers have saved, not just fellow officers, but also uh, civilians. And uh, when you see this happening over and over and over, it, it sort of gives you permission to try and expand your right. ability and say, you know what, there's a reason I should do this and, and look at how many examples are happening. There's no reason why I can't do that and have that same ability and right. increase my own skill set. Technology has allowed us to reach reach out that way uh, as well as pushing right. information out to others. Now, we hear a lot about Narcan in law mm -hmm. enforcement and that and that and that's a technology, so to speak, that's saved a lot of lives. Explain to our audience quickly, they may not be familiar with what that is and what that's used for. Well, Narcan, uh, the trade name is Narcan, the brand, excuse me, the brand name is Narcan, the okay. uh, generic name is uh, called Naloxone. So in some places it may be referred to as Naloxone. Uh -huh. It is an opiate antagonist and basically what it means is that if you have an opiate-based drug in your system and we put Narcan in your bloodstream, the Narcan will erase the effects of the opium. Uh, and one of the, uh, the, the first- They didn't have this for alcohol when we were in college? Oh, it would be nice, right? <laughs> and uh, one of the first questions I get to ask is, does this work for hangovers? <laughs> and unfortunately it does not. No, it doesn't. Uh, but um, our, our opioid epidemic is growing by leaps right. and bounds. Right. And it's hard to open a law enforcement journal and, and not see how bad it's getting in many places in the country. Cincinnati recently experienced over 170. Now, is, uh, just, this isn't, obviously I'm not an expert in this, but mm -hmm. Is this opiate issue, is that because they've cracked down on the prescriptions so much? You know, the, the pill shopping, the prescriptions, they've cracked down on maybe the oxy, so people are having to go to more of a heroin-based 
type drug or typically it does go from pills to heroin um, right of course there, there's no universal for everyone but typically people start off with pills but they become too expensive or hard to obtain so they right. go over to heroin um, in other places of the country east coast i mentioned cincinnati a moment ago uh, we, we're seeing an influx of much more powerful drugs um, one of them being carfentanil and carfentanil yeah. many thousands yeah. of times more powerful than just your baseline morphine drug, if you will. Right. And uh, this has got people passing out with a needle still in them and they're breathing immediately stopping. Uh, so much so that there are some departments around the country that are starting to carry double the dosage of Narcan trying to counter this uh, much more powerful form of opiate. So it's a, it's a, it's a this is our next battlefield as far as trying to save lives in, in the world Any idea drugs. nationwide uh, how many lives have been saved through Narcan? Um, as of about, my numbers aren't current. I can tell you as about yeah. two years ago, it was about 50,000 wow. uh, saves. Many of those have been made by family members. Um, many parts of the country, including here in Oklahoma, family members can go to a pharmacy and get Narcan rescue kits without a prescription. 50,000 lives. 50,000, yes. That's incredible. It's, it's huge, but again, this is, that's old information. Since then, yeah. the opiate problem has grown exponentially as has our response to wow. it. And uh, uh, our department, 800 officers, we all have Narcan now, as does Oklahoma City PD and Oklahoma Highway Patrol. Um, all federal law enforcement agencies. What's the cost on that? If an agency's watching this, what's the cost? Depending on, on where you go, anywhere from $60 up to $200 for one dose. For uh, for usually for two doses okay. in, in a rescue pack. Um, this is actually the problem has grown so big it's created problems for EMS agencies that have to use it much more than we do. It is okay. supply and demand. All right. The more officers carry Narcan, the more the cost of it goes up the more EMS agencies have to give it and are never reimbursed for it back. It, there's, it creates a lot of problems beyond just the person whose life is in danger right there. And I don't really right now, I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel at it. Wow. Um, it's going to wow. be a long road. Aren't you glad you're watching? I mean, when I say we bring on national experts, look what you get. My goodness, Anthony, first, last question. What, you are motivated, you're passionate. What drives you to um, do this? It, I, uh, I tell folks I've been in law enforcement for 17 years. I, I love my department. I love my job. I've had some of the greatest experiences with a badge on, and I've got the greatest war stories to tell at parties. But by far, the, the best stories I've ever had was in the medical arena when you actually yep. save a life. Uh, I've chased bad guys down alleys like many of you have, and I've, I've been in car chases and had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, but when you actually are that person who saved someone's life, mm -hmm. and you know that had you not done what you did, that person would not be here anymore. And those are right. pretty rare moments. Right. If you have that, you're walking on air for months after that. And just chasing that feeling and helping others to chase that feeling and know what it feels like to have that much of an impact on someone's life, that's the motivation. And I have the best job in the world. Um, our chief believes so much in this idea that he created a full-time position for me to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an extremely important thing for people to do and I have the best job because unlike most instructors who will teach and their students go on and we never hear back from them, my main body of students are my fellow officers. Yeah. So I get phone calls back every day or emails back yeah. every day from my best friends saying, hey, this is what I did. This is, this yeah. is how it worked and this was so cool. As an instructor, that's heaven right there. Getting it's, to hear back awesome. such immediate feedback and, and Certainly wasn't me that that created the information, but I love even playing a small part in that right. high that they feel in saving a life. It's incredible, Anthony. First, thank you for coming on. I appreciate you having me. Yes, very this much. is thank real you. live TV, as I said. There's no teleprompters. We're just <laughs> off the cuff and we're rolling with it. We get off on crazy tangents, but man, I cannot think of a more valuable thing that our audience needs to hear, and we look forward to having you back. I appreciate that very much. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Anthony first, uh, you can contact him through our website. We'll get any messages to him uh, that, that you maybe want to give him. You may have, you may need recommendations on training or advice. He'd be glad to answer them. And what an incredible, incredible interview with really an expert in a field that we all need to be more familiar in. So I told you at the very first of today's episode that we were going to talk to you about Lieutenant Jim Cook. Uh, he is the, was the unknown Lieutenant standing behind Colin Kaepernick during last Sunday's Buffalo Bills football game when the San Francisco 49ers got slaughtered by the Bills. Now that would be embarrassing enough to get beat that bad by the Bills, but the cool thing was, was Jim's photo just a few minutes after game time got sent out all across the world. It went completely viral and all of a sudden the unassuming Jim Cook, who's been a police officer for almost 30 years and um, worked for the Buffalo Bills for 29 years, uh, involved in Special Olympics. Uh, you know, he's, a, he's been a former SWAT team commander, undercover 
uh, diver, vast career, went to the FBI Academy. Uh, you know, incredible career, but fairly unassuming, all of a sudden has become the guy to know. And we were very fortunate to get to interview him prior to the shoulder day. And you can see all of that interview online uh, and on our podcast page. Just go to lobster.com, uh, hit, the, hit the podcast button, and you'll get that entire interview. But we're going to let you hear a segment of his interview that he talked to us earlier today about on what went into that decision that he made to salute right behind Colin Kaepernick. It's very fascinating, so here it is. Most police officers, Jim, across the country, you've been following the Colin Kaepernick situation, but really unlike most of everybody listening to this, you actually found yourself standing right behind him on national television. Did you ever think in your wildest dreams that that was even a possibility? No, actually, I never thought it would happen. But when I was assigned to the Sheriff's pregame pre -game field security detail uh, behind the bench, I knew that uh, if I had an opportunity, I was going to take advantage of it. So you were basically given an assignment when you arrived. It was, wasn't so, This wasn't something that was pre-planned. We saw some people talking online that maybe you had pre-planned this for weeks upon a time, but I don't think it was. It just kind of tell us how that assignment went and when you found out about it. Well, in our morning briefing, uh, with the uh, controversies going on, they wanted some extra uh, personnel on the field and... Uh, I was selected as one of the persons to be on the field. So you weren't specifically selected to be next to him. It just happened to work out that way, correct? Correct. I was behind the bench. I was detailed behind the bench for the pregame detail. Now, I know, Jim, you've received significant amount of attention through this one photograph, and I know you didn't ask for that attention, uh, but at what point did you decide to salute in the manner that you did and where you did, which happened to be right behind the, probably the most famous backup quarterback in the country right now, Colin Kaepernick. Well, you know, I can't say that I didn't ask for the attention. Um, I was assigned behind the bench, and I could have taken a couple steps back and blended in. Uh -huh. uh, however, I took a couple steps forward and decided to salute just before I went on the field. And I know law enforcement, speaking for law enforcement, Jim, we heard from a lot of them as well as you, is we were very appreciative because I know from our standpoint, it, it, you know, we've been beaten down quite a bit in recent years, and it just kind of seemed like a breath of fresh air when I saw it. I know a lot of people feel the same way. And did you did you even imagine sort of the attention that that was going to bring, or did that even cross your mind when you did it? Well, you know, as it was happening, I was thinking, uh, when I took the steps forward, I thought, oh, boy, this is going to be a big one. <laughs> um, I didn't think – I had no idea it was going to be this big, though. That's amazing. So here you are. You do this. You're working the game that Sunday, and, you know, you're busy. You're, you're running around. I've been at these athletic events before, and there's not a lot of downtime. At what point did you find out that this was kind of a really big deal on Sunday? You've got to tell our audience, certainly you're going to find that high-resolution photograph and hang it up somewhere in your home, right? I'm working, and I'm trying to track down an original picture. Um, if I can't find one, I'm going to have to uh, acquire or borrow one, borrow one from the uh, – Media sites. Most, most. Well, there you have it, Lieutenant Jim Cook. Incredible interview. Check out the rest of that on our podcast, On the Beat, at lobster.com. Thank you for joining us today as we talk to Anthony First, TAC medicine expert. Incredible information. We thank our sponsors, Blue Armor, supplements for law enforcement, by law enforcement. Check them out at bluearmor.com. And don't forget to check out In the Line of Duty Films. Incredible company providing incredible training for law enforcement around the world. We'll be back next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Central Time, where Dr. Mark Sherwood will be here to talk all kinds of your health, wellness, fitness, and supplement questions. So send in your questions uh, through our email, through our Facebook, and Mark will be there to answer them for you. It's going to be an incredible show. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Thank you for joining Law Officer Life.